Good morning. morning. It is a good day. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, good morning. morning. Say, you're looking good. Say, tell him, tell you're looking good. And then say, I'm looking good. Tell your neighbor. It's okay. You can say it. You guys see, you guys would all say good morning, but you won't compliment one another. That's all right. Well, we are just uh, kicking off this, this new message series, finding who we are in God, what we have in God, and what we can do in him. And I hope if, if uh, you heard Pastor Lynn talk about it, I hope you've had an opportunity to start in the devotional. We've been hearing these powerful, beautiful testimonies from people. And what I love about this time in the devotional is that God works, right? When you get quiet before God, the God of the universe actually wants to speak to us. He actually wants to talk to us. He has a lot he wants to say. And so we're hearing people say, you know what? I got still and I got quiet. And what I love is the things God is speaking is exactly what each child needs to hear just like a parent speaks to his children exactly what they need to hear and it's awesome and so as we're starting to go through this together I just want to pray for us this morning and we're going to talk about how to continue to live in this place can we pray together Holy Spirit all we desire this morning is you Jesus we really want life the way that you would offer it to us We don't want a gimmick. We don't want steps. We don't want a program. We want you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak clearly, that we would hear you, and that we would be able to to be positioned to fully embrace all you want to do. We ask in your name. Amen. Well, I want to talk this morning about, you know, we're in the middle of this 50-day journey of just getting quiet and being still in hearing from God. And I want to talk about how we make that our place of living. That this wouldn't just be a 50-day journey where we say, hey, for those 50 days, we got real quiet and God did things, and that was just the way we started the year. But that it's really more, no, this is my lifestyle. I want to talk about a culture of living in the place that we would call overflow. And overflow is the place where you're so full of God's presence that it just has to pour out of you everywhere you go. Wouldn't it be awesome if Christianity was just simple? Anybody with me? Anybody? You know, the Christianity Jesus defined was very simple. He said, love me with all of your heart and love your neighbors yourself. And then he said, you know what? You can't really do that. That's why you need my Holy Spirit to come in you. And if you would just stay in that place, I want to pour in and fill you up and fill you to overflowing. And I want to talk about how we can live there because the reality is we either live in one place or the other. There's two cities I would say we live in. You either live in the city of reason or you live in the city of of revelation. I'm going to say those are the only two cities that humanity can live in. That you either live in the place of reason. Now the place of reason is all about this thing. It's all about our mind. It's all about our plans. It's all about our fads. It's all about our steps. It's all about our to-do list. In this place, we've got book after book after book after book written with step after step after step. Has anybody lived here and would say this place is exhausting? Anybody there? When you're in this place, you're always trying to climb up the next rung of the ladder. You're trying to get to the next level, to be a better husband, to be a a, a better employee, to be a better mom or dad, to be a better Christian. And the God in this place is actually this thing at the top of your body. Pastor Ken says he has a brain that's trying to kill him. And I think that's true for a lot of us, is that we get to the place where here we're constantly trying to reason and we're trying to figure out and we're trying to grow. And here's a lot of guilt. Because we don't do it right. I don't know about you, but any marathon ladder climbers in the, in the house? Like, I get to the place where I'm climbing, and then I get exhausted, and I feel like I fall. I feel like if, if life is like a staircase, it's the escalator, except I'm trying to climb up the down escalator. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever feel like that in life? Where you're like, okay, all right, I'm climbing up, but I'm not going anywhere. And if I stop for a minute, I'm all back at the beginning. That's the end of reason. That's what life looks like there. Here, life is complicated because you have a separate box for everything. You have a box to be a spouse, you have a box to be an employee, you have a box to be a parent, you have a box to be a a, a neighbor, you have a box to be a person. And then there's this place, the land of Revelation. In the land of Revelation, you say, you know what, I've done all that. Tried climbing the staircase, I worked as hard as I possibly could, I can never get to the top of that thing. And so I'm done climbing. I can't do what's required of me, but I believe there's a God in heaven that loves me. 
and that because he loves me, he did what I couldn't do, and it's already all paid for, so it's not like I have this debt that I'm trying to pay off because Jesus paid the debt, and since Jesus paid the debt, I'm actually accepted and loved today as much as a hot mess as I am, that if I'm just quiet, he wants to speak to me, and he wants to move, and I don't need more steps. I actually just need revelation. You hear how much more simple that is? When you live in the land of revelation, you want to know what the step is? You ready? Be still and listen, and then just do what you hear. Did you know Jesus, when it talks about Jesus' life, Jesus' whole ministry, it says that everything Jesus did, three times in the Gospel of John, they said, how are you doing these miraculous things? He said, oh, it's simple. I just do whatever my father tells me to do. Jesus would come in the temple and teach things that made their mouths drop. They said they never heard authority like that. And listen, you got to understand something about the scribes and the teachers of the Bible. They memorized the entire Old Testament. I don't know about you, but that's pretty good. Anybody in the room memorized verbatim the entire Old Testament? Want to stand up? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's about as far as most of us can get. They had the whole thing. They had 618 laws, and they knew them all by heart, and they could pull them out, chapter and verse, chapter and verse. And yet it says, Jesus walks in the door, speaks two sentences, and they go, we've never heard revelation like that before. How the heck did you get that? He said, oh, it's easy, because I just stay in this place, and God the Father talks. And like what he said, I just said it. And then he tells me to go places, and where he tells me to go, I... I just go. Can we all agree that'd be pretty simple? It's a lot simpler than that, right? The reality is, as Christians, we're going to live in one land or the other. And this is, this is what I found. What I want to talk about today, and I'm going to have to define it a little bit, depending on your church experience. I'm going to talk about living in the place where we receive and release the prophetic. And I want to, I want to explain what I mean by the prophetic, because maybe you grew up in the place where you're like, prophetic, I know what that means. Maybe you grew up like me, though, that you hear prophecy and you're like, okay, prophecy, I think that's like when you tell about things in the future that are going to happen and they're usually really bad and scary. And that was the way I would define prophecy. I'm going to say this. I believe with all of my heart that what God wants for you and I is to live a supernatural life that is not carrying burdens, that is not carrying stresses, that's not carrying weights, that we actually hear from God and we release what he does. And I believe in order to do that, we've got to get away from some of the weird Okay, can we, just, can we just say that some people who've said they speak for God sometimes act weird? Is that, can we just say that? Is that fair? I mean, John the Baptist showed up wearing like a, a coat of like camel hair and eating bugs, right? And, and prophets have a tendency sometimes to be weird. So has anybody ever been in a place where you turned on the TV and somebody said, God said this, and you're like, they're weird. Anybody, let's just be honest. Can we not be churchy? Anybody ever heard somebody say something that said it was from God, and you were like, you just seem a little weird, Okay. We've got to de-weird this thing. We've got to demystify it because, listen, the most natural thing the God of the universe could possibly do is talk to you. It's the most natural thing he could do. I want to tell you that prophecy, that God desires to release in your life, and I want to redefine prophecy, by the way. Prophecy is not telling future events that are scary. Prophecy simply means to preach what God is saying, that God speaks and that you say it. That's literally what the word means in the original languages. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it defines it. And I want to I look at this because we're going to look at a life of a prophet that I believe God wants to be like us. We're going to look at the life of Elijah this morning. But I think if we're going to understand it, we've got to actually know what prophecy is and get the wrong picture out of our head and get the right picture in our head because we're either going to live in this place of exhaustion or we're going to live in this place of, of blessing. And prophecy, as God defines it, and in fact, if, if you came in, you have a message guide, you could follow along. There's some notes on there. Prophecy is simply hearing from God and him speaking through you to others. It's simply the place where you're living life in the overflow. You hear what God is saying to you as a lifestyle. And whatever God is saying, you're releasing back out. And in fact, would it surprise you to hear that God desires you to be a prophet? That's one of the key things he calls you as his child. Would that surprise you? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, this is what he says, and I want to unpack it. It says, pursue love and earnestly desire. Say earnestly. 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 Earnestly means eagerly. It means with excitement. It means with anticipation. Earnestly means you cannot shut up about it. He says, I want you to earnestly desire to expect to not shut up about spiritual gifts, especially that you would prophesy. For the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and their encouragement and their consolation or their comfort. 
And so I want you to picture this. I want you to picture, I have five children, and I want you to picture that I went to my kids and I said, now listen, this is what I want you to do. I want you to pursue my heart. That's what the beginning of that says, pursue love, right? God's heart is love. That's all God is. God is love. He tells us his kids, pursue it. And so I say, hey kids, listen, I love you. I want you to look like me. I want you to have the same values I have. I want you to love people the way I love people. So far, so good, right? And then I come to my kids and I say, and I want you to earnestly desire an Xbox for Christmas. I mean, like, eagerly. I want you to talk about it. I want you to draw pictures of the Xbox. I want you to dream about the Xbox. I want you to talk to each other. I want you to make lists of all the games you're going to get. Oh, by the way, I'm not ever going to get you an Xbox. I have no intent of giving you an Xbox, but earnestly desire it. Would that not be the cruelest father in the world? See, a father can't tell you to earnestly desire something that he doesn't want to fully give. So when God shows up, you know, how weird would it be if I said, hey, kids, listen, I want you to, I want you to earnestly desire an Xbox. However, I have to tell you, the age of giving out Xboxes ended hundreds of years ago. And so we don't do that anymore. And now I'm the last one that got an Xbox, and I just kind of want to talk about it and want you to desire it. But do you realize that's what's happening in the church today? Do you realize in the church today there are people saying that, that you would be called heretical for saying that the God of the universe could speak to you and speak through you? They say, that's wrong. You're adding to scripture. Yeah, except in scripture, you were told to earnestly desire that God would speak to you and speak through you because you're a prophet and you can't earnestly desire something he doesn't want to give. So he said, I want you to earnestly desire, eagerly desire. Why? I'll tell you two things. One, it's the most normal thing God could possibly do in your life. You want to live in a place of blessing, and I think we could all agree we do. And you can get to the place of blessing by either trying to climb this exhausting staircase that never works and never gets there, or believe that the God of the universe actually wants to speak to you every day and align your life to learn how to hear him. By the way, he's been speaking since before you were born. You know why? Prophecy is the most normal thing God could possibly do. Speaking is the most normal thing God could do. Look at the beginning of the story. What's the first thing God did in our story? In the beginning was... The, the, the heavens and the earth were formless, and God spoke. When God made us, what's the first thing he did? He breathed life into us, and then he spoke. You know, it's pretty amazing, because it, it, uh, my buddy uh, Shane, who leads our youth worship, came in and called me a, a few weeks ago and said, hey, you know what the first thing God spoke to us? And I was like, I'm the teaching pastor. Of course I know the first thing God spoke to us. God said we need to be fruitful and multiply and that we need to go be kings. He said, oh, no, 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 but before that. I said, what? He said, doesn't it say that when God made us, the first thing he did was he blessed us? I was like, oh, man, that's good. The very first thing God did when he breathed you was bless you. He spoke a blessing over you. And by the way, being able to be fruitful and multiply and being able to reign in this earth with him is a blessing. It's not a burden. It's actually your destiny. He's the creator. He wants you to be creative. He's the king. He wants you to rule. God spoke. God speaks. It's the most natural thing he could do, but I'm going to go further than that. I'm going to say this morning that I believe living in a place where we regularly hear from the God of the universe, not our own plans and not our own programs, is necessary. There was a man named Solomon that wrote, and in fact, if you remember the story, and it'll help us when we get to Elijah. You remember, God chose his people. He blessed them. He told them that he wanted to be their king and reign, but the people fell away. And one day there was this man named Samuel. Samuel was a godly dude. And Samuel got up and said, God, I want you more than anything. However, all of the people, Samuel lived in this place of revelation. It says that he lived before God's presence, and it's awesome. When he was a little boy, God spoke his name, Samuel, Samuel. And he heard it in such a way that he actually thought calling him and he ran he said no no God's speaking to you you're a prophet and Samuel lived there all of his days and he heard God and suddenly he started hearing this voice from the people and the people Samuel wanted more than anything for the people of Israel to move from the land of reason to the land of revelation because listen you need to understand this if you live in the land of reason long enough it always ends up in treason always I'm going to say that again because you need it to sink in we've been called to serve Jesus Christ as our king the kingdom of heaven. But where Christians live by reason, by our plans, by our logic, by what makes sense to us, if you live here long enough, it always ends in treason. 
And so Samuel heard the people say, we want a king. Why? So we can be like the other nations. We looked at what the other nations did, and we want to be just like them. Reason. And Samuel grieved, and he said, no, God is king. It's illogical. You're supposed to only serve him. And God said, you know what? Don't, don't worry, Samuel. Give them what they want. Because one day I'm going to raise up a king out of their own people. And he's going to come, and he's going to set him free. And I'm going to open the way for all people to leave this place of their own reasoning and their own exhausting plans, their place of slavery, and come into the place of my blessing where they're just free to know me and to hear me and to respond. But for now, give them a king. And through some time passing, Samuel anointed David as the king. And sure enough, the one that would come was called the son of David. And David, except for this incident that he had with Uriah and his wife Bathsheba, David was a man wholly committed to God. He got to the end of his life. David heard from God. David wrote songs that he got from God. He said, God, you speak, and you're amazing, and your love is better than life itself. And I get your revelations, and I hear you. And I want more than anything for this to be permanent. I want all of those people that I love in this godless land to come live here. So God, can I just build a house for your name? I want a temple that will be permanent. And he said, no, it's, it's not for you to do, David. It's for your son to do. Because the reality is that the son of David was going to come a long time later and build the temple of the Holy Spirit where God could dwell forever. You following? So it comes to the place where David comes. And then his son Solomon takes over. And Solomon started right. God asked Solomon, what do you want, Solomon? You can have anything you want. Solomon didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for fame. He said, give me a wise heart. He said, I'd know how to live in the place where I could follow you. He said, man, that's good, Solomon. I'm going to give you that. And Solomon, in Proverbs chapter 3, he wrote something that was pretty powerful. He says this. He said, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. It's as if Solomon was standing here and saying, how are you going to live in a way that works? You need to trust in the Lord. You need to trust in what the Lord says with all of your heart. There's no room for anything else. There's no room for Jesus and. There's no room for Jesus is my co-pilot, right? It's his car and he needs to be driving. Jesus only. He says, trust in him with all of your heart and do not what? Lean on your own understanding. Right? Then he says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. And he'll direct your paths. Live by revelation, not by reason. Reason is going to get you off the course. Revelation is what you need. And I'll say this, guys. Uh, for a lot of us, I know in my own life that I'll find myself serving in a place where it's simple with God for a time. I've gotten to, to lead a lot of summer camps. I've gotten to lead mission trips. And I've gotten to have a lot of correspondence with people in penitentiaries or prisons. And you know what I found about those three places in particular? Summer camps, mission trips, prisons. There are people living in this beautiful place with God where they just hear from him. The distractions of this world are, are gone. They're desperate to hear his voice. And oh my gosh, some miraculous stuff happens. And then they get home. And they live in a different land. And because they live in a different land, before you know it, they find themselves coming back over here. And life becomes about the shoulds and the shouldn'ts and the steps and the plans and the exhaustion and the effort and the figuring out, and they wonder where the wonder has gone. Unfortunately for Solomon, that's what happened. Solomon got to the place starting with God. He started perfect, and then in time he said, this isn't enough. I still need something else. So it says that Solomon uh, had a little problem with the ladies, and he married 700 wives and took 300 concubines. And they led his heart astray to, to foreign gods. Now, it's interesting. Solomon wrote in the Proverbs that it's better to live on the corner of a roof than to live with a quarrelsome wife. And I, I guess, you know, I could understand that because one of the things that makes a wife want to be quarrelsome is you having 699 other wives. That's one thing that, that can kind of get in the way just a little bit of that. Solomon got to the place where he started living in his own reason. And unfortunately, the whole kingdom under Solomon, under his son, it's split in half. You know why? Because if you live by reason, it always ends up in treason. You stop following the true king, you become your own king, and everything falls apart. And so we fast forward. We come to the place where suddenly this man named Elijah comes onto the scene. There's a king. His name's Ahab. Say Ahab. Ahab. It, and he's just like it sounds. Ahab was a miserable man, and he started worshiping a god named Baal. And Baal was supposed to be the god of fertility, 
having children, and the God of all weather. And what was happening was Ahab and the true king, Ahab's wife was who I would call the true king of Israel at that time. Her name was Jezebel. And Ahab's wife, Jezebel, loved the Baals. She set up prophets, and those prophets and Jezebel killed every prophet of the Lord they could find. A man named Elijah and some other prophets got hidden, and they set up Baal temples everywhere. And now these people, who are supposed to be the one people to show the entire world that God is real and that he's loving, are led in a way where all they're following is their own reason. You need to understand this. A lot of times we hear Baal worship and, or, or false god worship, and when you read that in the Bible and you think, that's so awful of them, how could they do that? Here's what you need to understand. The gods they worship, they believed they wanted to have kids. That's where all your future was. And so they believed they needed to bow down and do whatever it takes so that the gods who give kids give them kids. You know what that is? That's reason. They believed they needed food and sustenance. Now, do we care about families, food, sustenance? Do we? Of course we do. What I would say is they were no different than we are. You can change the name of the God all you want to. But when you follow a God by your own reason in order to get to your ends of what you feel you need in order to be successful, you're living in the land of reason. And you live in the land of reason long enough, it always leads to treason. But then there was this guy named Elijah, came into a godless day, came into a day when everybody had lost hope, everybody had fallen away, and the hope of most had grown cold. And Elijah showed up and said, you know what? I believe there's a God in heaven, and I believe he wants to work and breathe and move through me, and I want to release something different. So in our day today, I guess we could go around for a long time and talk about how hopeless it can seem to look outside, right? You've seen the news reports. I've seen the news reports. Things can look kind of bleak, right? We can either live there, stay there, try to strive our way through that, or we could ask God for the age of the prophets to rise up, for men and women of God who know who they are and know how to hear from God, to be able to live in a place with God, not just for 50 days, but for a life to be able to see him pour through us. And so with that, if you have a Bible, I want to ask you to open up with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. If not, you can open up on your phone, or we will have the, the passages on our screen as well. As we're looking at this idea of how to live in a place with God that is full of joy, how to live in a place where you're hearing his voice, how to live in a place where you feel life and hope and love, I believe there are five keys that God would have for us. I believe there are five keys to living a life in the overflow. Now, it's important that you hear that these aren't things we need to pick up that are extras. These are lenses to see life through. So if you've been in the place where you're walking through this devotional and you're going, oh, my goodness, God's starting to speak to me. How do I live there? I believe there's five things we really need. And we see them in the life of a man named Elijah. The first thing that you see for us as far as lifestyle keys to live is exaltation. And exaltation would be this idea of living in a place of gratitude, living in a place where when you get up every morning, you can count your blessings and you're celebrating everything God is doing. And so we look at the story. It says this. Now Elijah the Tishbite in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there will neither be dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him and he said, Turn eastward from here and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, as I've commanded, ravens to feed you there. And so he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith that's east of the Jordan. And the ravens bought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And so the picture is this. God says to Elijah in a day where it seems like things are not going well and people are turning away from God. Can you relate it all to that? Does it ever feel dark outside, like people are not there, they don't have hope, people are getting mean, they're hopeless, and they desperately need to see hope. They desperately need to see love. That was Elijah. And it says Elijah burst onto the scene. And Elijah showed up and he said, listen, here's what's going on. You've lived so far here in this land of reason, in this land of you trying to figure it out and being your own gods, that you've missed the living water itself, and so now the heavens have dried up and it's not going to rain again. And it's not going to rain again, not because God's cruel and mean and awful. In fact, in this story, it says again and again and again, the reason God took the rain away was so they would turn and seek him, so they would see who he was. But they weren't having it. 
And so he says, Elijah, listen, I'm speaking. And Elijah heard some pretty crazy stuff. First, he heard this. He heard, Elijah, you're going to go forward and you're going to say it's not going to rain anymore. Okay? Now, listen, I don't know if you ever watch meteorologist on the news. Sometimes it feels like they're just rolling the dice, like it's going to be hot today and it's going to rain sometime. You know, like, and like even the percentages sometimes, I don't know. I just almost feel like they're making it up. And it'll be a 40% chance. Like, who's going to tell them they're wrong? It rains and we're like, oh, wow, it's only 40% today, right? And if it doesn't rain when it was 90%, we're like, we got so lucky. It didn't rain. It was a 90% chance of rain. It's like, but I don't know. I think the meteorologist might just be guessing, like, we'll just throw out a number. I mean, who's going to challenge us? Like, who knows more about the weather, right? Us or the viewer. It'd be a pretty bold thing to stand up and say, hey, by the way, I want you to imagine me standing up on the stage this morning saying, guys, God spoke to me this morning. It's not going to rain ever again until I stand on this stage and say it'll rain. Can we agree that's pretty bold? It's pretty crazy. But Elijah said, I know what God said. That's what God said. And so I'm going to say it. And he said, oh, by the way, Elijah, it's going to come true. So when you say it, it's going to stop raining. And they're going to blame you. Because sometimes, by the way, when you hear God and you report what God's saying, people don't like you for it because it makes them uncomfortable to hear what God's saying. Because, listen, over here, we at least know where the car's going. If I get to drive my own car, I know where it's going. I build the steps. It feels safe and secure. The problem is all the cars are going off of a, a cliff, right? Over here's the only way that leads to life. And sometimes people don't like it when you stand over here and say, come on in. The water's great. He said, they're going to hate you for it, Elijah. You're going to need to run and hide now. He said, in fact, you're going to hide because they're going to seek your life, but I'm going to provide for you. In that place, I'm going to put you by a brook, and there's going to be water you're going to drink, and I'm going to send birds to feed you. I don't know. I think that's pretty cool. And it says, so Elijah went, and he did so. But then it says in verse 7, after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Now, I don't know about you, but at that point, exaltation might not be what I'm thinking. I'm the one dude in the land that loves God, that wants to see him show up, that wants to see him be holy, that wants to see him reign. I've heard him. Now I'm hiding by myself, hanging out with birds that feed me, and all the water's gone. And I don't know about you, but we live in a place, I've, I've heard people say before, that oftentimes in, in the most provided for places, we're the least grateful because we don't know what a blessing looks like anymore. We're surrounded by so many of them that we've become entitled. Elijah's at this place where it would have been easy to say, God, come on. Why couldn't you provide supernatural water for me some other way? Why do I have to hide? I'm doing it right. And Elijah instead kept his eyes on God saying, no, Lord, you're taking care of me. And so as he continued to listen, it says this, the word of the Lord came to him and said, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and, and live there. I've commanded a widow there to feed you. And so Elijah goes on in this unconventional way. God says, I'm going to protect you. And I would say in the same place, listen, if you and I want to live in a place where you live a life in the overflow, I really, really, really believe it means that we need to live lives of exaltation. It means that we get up in the morning and say, God, you've already done everything. You've put breath in my lungs. You've made me alive. You've paid everything. If I'm a Christian, I never have a reason to drop my head again because you paid it all. You broke every bond. You broke every chain. But it doesn't stop there. I believe for a prophet, it goes from exaltation to expectation. And I believe we're expecting God then to show up and move in our lives. And I would define expectation as an honest evaluation and alignment of what you expect from God and in life with God. This is what I mean. When you wake up in the morning as a believer, as a Christian, when you come to church on a Sunday morning and somebody says, this is true. When somebody says something like, Jesus said you'll do even greater things than he did because he goes to the Father. Jesus says that the same power that rose him from the dead lives in you. How do you respond? Because if you get really, really, really excited, that means you're really, really, really expectant. But can I be honest? There are times in my life where Jesus says things here, and because I, get, I went out there and I tried it, and it didn't seem to work, I don't really believe it. And so I get mad at people when they tell me it's available because I feel like I tried it, and I feel like they're telling me I failed. If we're going to live lives of revival, we've got to come before God and restore expectation, to expect him to stir, to expect him to move. And so it goes with Elijah. It says this, the word of the Lord uh, came to him, and he arose and went, and he came to the city gate, and there was a widow gathering sticks. And he called her and said, bring me a little water and a vessel that I may drink. 
And as she was going to bring it, he said to her, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Now, this is crazy, okay? It was customary in that day for Elijah to show up and for a man to ask a woman in the city at that point in their day to say, can you give me something to drink? That would have been their custom. However, there's a drought going on. So Elijah shows up and is like, hey, I'm the man of God. I'm the man of love. Give me something to drink. And there's no, no water. There's nothing to drink. And then it says, as she's going to get it, she hasn't even come back with the drink yet. He's like the husband sitting on the couch during the football game saying, you know, can you give me something to drink? And they're in there. And while you're in there, can you also get me? He says, also bring me a morsel of bread from your hand. And then she says to him, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and only a little oil in a jug. And now... I'm out here gathering a couple of sticks so that I can go in and prepare it for myself and my son so that we can eat it and die. You know, when I look at life, and this is even with Christians, when I look at myself, there's all too many times that what I felt I'm doing is saying my real sense of expectation in the morning is just be as faithful as I can, press as hard as I can, do as much as I can, do the best job I can until I die. Can we be honest? Is that not where most even believers are living? That our expectation has been so lowered. I'm not saying there's not a million reasons for that. I'm not saying things don't happen. My dad died when I was six. Okay, I'm not talking about tragedy we don't understand, but I'm saying that in that place, if we don't make an honest evaluation of what's going on in our heart, we will end up here, and we will quote Bible verses for it as if it's noble. But when you live in the land of treason, it, in the land of reason, it always leads to treason, always. It will always lead your heart away from something that God has for your provision. So the question I'd ask you is this, do you expect God to be God? Do you expect God to speak to you? Do you expect God to speak through you? Do you expect God's kingdom to come? When we sing some of these songs and you watch Pastor Chris up here dancing like a lunatic, is it easier for you to say, yeah, he's dancing like that because that's my inheritance too, or wow, Pastor Chris really has a special anointing. See, that's about expectation. Because when I expect something, I've got to show it. I'm not talking about whether you raise your hands. I'm a more reserved person. Okay, so you're probably not ever going to catch me doing backflips across as we're doing worse. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the level of your heart. Do you expect God to show up? Because when we live in a land, listen, where it's really dark, we could talk about how dark it is outside, but when it's darkest, that's when the light is most evident. It was so dark that this woman said, I just expect to die. And Elijah said, you know what? Oh, no, 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 no. I have a different expectation. The third one, I would say if we want to live there, we live in a place of exaltation, we live in a, in a place of expectation, but then the third one would be spiritual relaxation, which leads to revelation. I like the word relaxation. I don't know about you. I think relaxation is a great word to just relax. Because you know when Jesus says in John 15 that you've been called to abide with him, you know what the word abide means? It means to relax. It means to dwell, to sit, and to do nothing but be his. And sometimes what I find is I'll share this, and I'm so excited, and I look at people that look like they are getting a root canal. And listen, all too often I sit in a place where I hear somebody share it, and they're so excited, and I look like I'm getting a root canal. Why? I think it comes to the place that something's happened with our expectation, and since we don't expect God to move, we can't relax because you really are good people and you really do want great things for your life. If you don't expect God to move, you will come up with your own plans. And this is where I find most Christians living is they're not relaxed. But listen, the only place you get revelation is in the place of spiritual relaxation. The story continues with Elijah and this widow, okay? So Elijah's shown up. He's found out this is the lady that's supposed to feed him. This is what God spoke, okay? And she says, I'm here. And I just want you to imagine this for just a minute. Elijah shows up in the city. There's no water. God's supposed to provide for him. He says, here I am. God says, go to that woman. And he goes to the woman. He's like, awesome. Listen, you're supposed to provide for me. So are you like, like a princess? Like you live in a castle? She's like, no, I'm destitute. We don't have anything. Right. But like your husband works somewhere. Yeah, my husband died last week. Right. Hang on one second. God, you got the wrong lady. Like, I mean, like I would be freaking out at that moment. 
And yet Elijah says this, listen. She says, we're gathering some sticks so we can die. I, like, I don't know a worse possible, like, awesome. <laughs> and Elijah said to her, listen, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. Now, I think that's hilarious. She just said, what are you doing? Preparing some sticks so my son and I can die. He's like, okay. Well, you go ahead and do that. <laughs> and while you're doing that, I got some more revelation. By the way, listen. Sometimes with miserable, miserable people, the only thing you can do is love them in their misery. Right? Elijah didn't come and say, I'm going to give you five reasons you shouldn't do that. He's like, okay, if you're set. But I'm going to show you right now you don't need to live there. You don't need to live another day in striving. He said, so first, make a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. And here's what I find crazy. This thing's happening at this speed. Elijah just went into a city. God says, talk to her. He talks to her. He finds out she's a widow. Right? As he finds out she's a widow, he finds out she has nothing. As he finds out she has nothing, he finds out that she's at such a place of hopelessness that she's ready to die, and this is the lady that's supposed to feed him. His first words are, don't fear. And somehow, because Elijah's living in such a place of communion with God, that in the middle of this conversation, he's receiving from his father. He's in a place of relaxation, which leads to revelation, because now he tells her something straight from the throne room of God. And he says this. He says, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Your jar of flour shall not be spent. Your jug of oil shall not be empty until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. What is he saying? Yeah, there's a drought. Yeah, you got the last little smidgen. Yeah, it's going to last for a day and you guys are going to die. But if you'll do this one thing, you're going to find it's never going to run out. You guys are going to come out of this okay. Just go make that. Just give me the first cake. And God's going to do it. And then it says this, and she went and did what Elijah said. That's crazy. It says, and so she and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Listen, when people live here, it draws people from here to come and live here too. When you're faithful, and you're going to be misunderstood, and it's going to be weird. Listen, ministry was a lot easier before I had to come start giving weird messages like this. But it's truth. And we can live here, but we've got to destroy our plans over there. If we're going to. It'd be great if the story could just end there. Except it didn't. From there, we've got to come to a place of resolution. I don't know if you've ever had it, where God has spoken something to you, and you were so sure this was God, only to find that it didn't quite work out the way you thought. Anybody? Been there? Where God said, do this, be faithful, it'll come through, and the fruit didn't pour out at all the way you thought it would? That's when there needs to be resolution. I say resolution is the point of when you know that God said something that you refuse to move from that place. The story goes on with Elijah. It says that Elijah, the woman, her son, they all lived. Elijah was so honored, they built him a room upstairs. He gets free lodging and free food. Times are good. Till it says this. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. I would say that's a pretty severe illness. When there is no more breath left in you, if the doctor says, how sick are you? And like, he doesn't have any more breath in him, it's bad. So she said to Elijah, what do you have against me, O man of God? You've come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. I don't know about you, but that can be a lot like me, is that I can turn a lot of times and when things aren't working out in my life, I can turn and blame God and say, God, the reason this must be happening is you're remembering something that I did back there. You're holding on to something I did back there. What's wrong with you? And at this point, Elijah would have every reason to freak out, but look at what it says. He said to her, give me your son. He took him from her arms and carried him up into the inner chamber. Elijah went to a place where he was quiet before God. He closed the door. He laid on his own bed, and he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you even brought calamity among this widow who I lodge with by killing her son? When I talk about resolution, I'm not talking about pie-in-the-sky thinking that goes, oh, Jesus is Lord, everything's going to be okay. No, Elijah went in his room and began to yell at God. 
say, okay, God, you brought me here, and I'm obeying you, and everything you're saying, I'm doing, but now this kid is dead, and I just cannot believe that in your heart and in your character for them, you do it. And I can tell you, listen, there are times in my life where God did not move in the way I thought he would, and I found myself drifting back to the place of reason. I found myself drifting back to the place of saying, I don't want to be hurt again by trusting God in the supernatural, so I'll just do something safe over here and try my best. And in that moment, Elijah refused to stay there. And he said, no, I'm going to close my door. I'm going to be honest before the Lord. And this is, this is super cool. It says, he stretched himself out upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, oh, Lord, let this child's life come into him again. Sometimes when God speaks to us, what he's going to say is going to be crazy. It's going to be illogical. It's going to be something, in fact, for many times in my life, I lived so much here that I'd go to a summer camp and get it here, but I still didn't know how to live over here. I lived over there. It wasn't until finally I said, you know what? I'm never going to get to the top of this staircase. I'm never going to be a good enough husband. I'm never going to be a good enough father. It's not in my capacity. That's why I need a savior. And when I kicked away the plans here in destitution and failure, and came over here, suddenly I found that God had a lot he wanted to say to me, and I just needed to learn how to hear his voice. But when God starts to speak and it doesn't work the way you think it's going to work out, we can't in that moment return to the land of reason. Because what's waiting right on the other side of that is the very last step, and it's impartation. Impartation is when God speaks and you're faithful and his kingdom falls. Impartation is when something is released and something changes. So this is awesome. Elijah's on the bed. Elijah's crying out and saying, God, save this kid. And I don't know how many times you've gone by an ambulance, but you don't normally see the paramedics on the, on the floor doing that, right? So we can all agree it's pretty radical to lay down on a dead guy and start begging for his life to come back. But that's not the part that really gets exciting. It's the next one. It says this. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber and gave him to his mother. And the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. See, the moment where everything changed is in a dark day. If we could have men and women of God crazy enough to say, you know what, I'm not just going to add God as another section in the newspaper. He's going to be my life. And I can't ever figure it out. I can't ever be enough. I just need to know him. And I'm going to know him in a way that I need to hear him speak. And I need to be still. Because if I, if I could learn that, what I'd find is there's things he wants to pour out of me. And if he could pour out of me in this place, what starts to happen is people in droves start coming from the land of reason to live in the land of revelation with you. And so Elijah went on from there and ended up bringing revival to the entire city. The question I need to ask is what needs to be revived in your life? Where is it right now? That if I asked at the beginning of the day, what are your dreams? What are your hopes? What are your expectations? I probably need to ask just as much what died. What's sitting on the table looking where you're crying out saying, oh God, let the life return to this thing again. Where is it that you need to leave a place of living by your reason and really live in a place of trusting God and trusting his love and trusting his revelation? And so I want to end very simply this morning. There were five particular challenges I put out. And I know when I share, um, a lot of what I can share can, can sound intense. There's no room for condemnation within the kingdom of God. As we come before our king, he loves us. He wants to stir deeply in our hearts and in our lives. So I want to ask you a few questions. And if it's you, I just want us to be the church this morning. There are five areas I talked about. And if you find yourself right now this morning with no guilt, no shame, no condemnation, if you find yourself saying, you know what, I live too much over here. I live in my own head and I live wondering why I'm not seeing the miraculous pour through me. I'm wondering why I'm not imparting anything. It's because I'm living in the land of reason. There's no guilt. There's no shame. But why? What do I need to lay down? So I want to ask a few questions. First of all, if you're in here today and you say what I'm wrestling with is exaltation. When I get up every day, I don't find myself counting my blessings. I find myself thinking about everything that's not working. 
found myself, find myself thinking about everything that's broken. I really need that sense of gratitude to wash over me. I need God to change my perspective. I need the Holy Spirit to come. I need fresh revelation of what he's given me so that I can rejoice in it. All I'm going to ask from where you are is if that's you, for you to stand up. If you're in the place where you're saying, I'm struggling by allowing my circumstances to just weigh me down. And I don't find gratitude. I don't find praise. If that's you, I just want to ask you to stand. It's good. As they stand, what I'm going to ask the rest of the church, if you can look around, we're just going to be the body of Christ. I'm going to ask one or two of you to come to each of these people standing. And you're going to pray with your voice, with the Holy Spirit in you, that God would begin to just bless them and release this sense of gratitude over their lives. So I want to ask anybody in the room, I'm not talking just pastors or leaders, Christ in you is the hope of glory. I want to ask you just to come around one of these saying, you know what, I need gratitude. Could you just come around them and just begin to pray for them? Maybe you're one this morning that what feels broken is expectation, that you could think about times where you've been fiery after God. You could think about times where you were ready to rush hell with a water pistol, and right now you just feel jaded because you put yourself out there and it feels like God didn't come through. You tried to trust his promise, it feels like it's all falling apart, and you just feel like you're being assaulted. If that's you, and you say, I need expectation again, I want to ask you to stand. I need to expect God to move again. I want to ask you to stand. same way, I just want to ask church if you can come around them. If you see somebody standing, they don't have anybody around them, just come around and pray for them. If you're sitting near them, you can just lay a hand on them and just pray for the Lord to bless them. Maybe you're in the place where you find yourself